Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this video, we'll be covering the most common tumors of the central nervous system that you're most likely to encounter on step one. With the tiniest amount of effort, you'll have no problem nailing these questions on test day, just like our budding pathologist here. As with all recordings, a PDF of this presentation is available at the 12 Days website. For simplicity, we'll break down the tumors into ones identified by histopathology and those which are not. As you can tell from this flowchart, pathology will be key in identifying the type of tumor you're dealing with. The NBME is big on pathology, especially with brain tumors. For the tumors on the right, you'll likely be given a clinical presentation, and then you'll be asked to identify the tumor. We will only be covering the quick and dirty of these lesions. Before even launching the presentation, I've summarized the major histopathology thoughts or language you can easily master to nail these topics on step one. Consider this a sneak preview. And to further simplify, we can take pituitary adenoma off the list as these have already been covered in the endocrine videos, but just remember to be on the lookout for the adenoma if they present an adult with bitemporal hemianopsia. And finally before launching, it's worth going over some basic neurohistology because the tumors we'll be dealing with will be derived from these cell types. I know histo can be painful, but we'll spice it up for you so you can remember these better. Oligodendrocytes are cells that myelinate the axons of the central nervous system and have nuclei that resemble a zesty tomato. Neurons are big and don't give rise to any tumors on the boards. Microglia are the immune cells of the central nervous system and resemble a spicy jalapeno. And finally, astrocytes do a lot of heavy lifting in the CNS and have nuclei that resemble a potato. Most importantly, they stain positive for GFAP. This will be key shortly. How will you know when the NBME is talking about a brain tumor? Their classic buzz phrase is, dull headache worst in the morning. But also be on high alert for new seizures in an older patient, or the presence of papilledema on physical exam, signaling increased intracranial pressure. This is the language of brain tumors for the boards. Before we get into the primary brain tumors, let's talk about brain metastases. Mets to the brain are just about as common as primary tumors. Suspect brain mets when you have a primary tumor elsewhere, especially in the lung, and also when you have multiple lesions spread throughout the brain, particularly at the gray-white matter junction. The patient will present with the usual signs and symptoms of their primary tumor, like hemoptysis and weight loss for lung, but also start experiencing new seizures or a new focal neuro deficit. All right, let's get started on tumor pathology. We'll start off with CNS tumors found primarily in kids, namely pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, and craniopharyngioma. The pilocytic astrocytoma, or as Dr. Sattar aptly calls it, the pilocystic astrocytoma, is the most common brain tumor in kids overall. Yep, there's a cyst all right. These benign tumors are derived from astrocytes, so they'll stain positively for GFAP, just like glioblastoma, which we'll see later on. You should also be familiar with the histopathology of these tumors, which will be described by their thick eosinophilic processes called Rosenthal fibers. These are the classic findings, Rosenthal fibers. And one more time, these astrocytomas are from astrocytes, which stain positively for GFAP. At first glance, this MRI might look a bit similar to Dandy Walker, so how are you going to distinguish the two? An astrocytoma will be acquired, and a Dandy Walker malformation is congenital. Remember, kids with Dandy Walker have never been dandy at walking. How will these benign tumors present in kids? That's actually irrelevant from the board's point of view. All they care about is this pathology slide, which shows you pink Rosenthal fibers within the GFAP-positive proliferating astrocytes as the hallmark of the pilocytic astrocytoma. Moving on to medulloblastoma, we need to start with a renaming. Let's call this bad boy the granular cerebellar cell oma. Because they arise from granular cells in the cerebellum and grow rapidly, the NBME will come after you by showing you a cerebellar mass in a child causing an obstructive hydrocephalus. What is a granular cell? Its real only purpose on the boards is to give rise to medulloblastomas which is neural ectoderm in origin. Those are the only two things you need to know about them. As for the clinical presentation, since these tumors are cerebellar, they can cause lesions in the vermis and thereby present with ataxia. Medulloblastomas are bad news. 
They grow rapidly and have a poor prognosis, and pretty unique to the medulloblastoma is that it can metastasize outside of the brain itself. It can send drop metastases down through the CSF, finding a nice cozy home in the spinal cord. A child with a brain tumor that metastasizes to the spinal cord is board speak for medulloblastoma. Don't be thrown off if you suddenly see symptoms of spinal cord compression in a child with a cerebellar mass causing truncal ataxia and obstructive hydrocephalus. It's just the NBME's way of telling you that this granular cell oma has metastasized to the spinal cord. One more way they may come after you. You could see a biopsy which will include these homer right rosettes of small round blue cells wrapped around pink neuritic processes. The question itself is likely to ask you about the origin of the tumor, granular cells of the cerebellum deriving from neural ectoderm. Let's take a second to review some of the causes of hydrocephalus in children for your exam. From our congenital video, you should be very familiar with aqueduct stenosis, Chiari 2 malformations, and occasionally Dandy Walker malformations. Let's now add medulloblastoma to this list as an acquired, not congenital, cause of pediatric hydrocephalus. Next up for the kiddos is a hypothalamic tumor, the craniopharyngioma. Not to be confused with a pituitary adenoma, Craniopharyngiomas are tumors most often found in children and can also present with bitemporal hemianopsia. From the NBME's standpoint, bitemporal hemianopsia in a kid equals craniopharyngioma and in an adult equals pituitary adenoma. The giveaway here will be the gross appearance of this tumor, cystic calcifications containing fluid that resembles motor oil. The fluid is composed of cholesterol crystals. I guarantee you they'll ask about the embryological origin of this tumor. It comes from remnants of Rathke's pouch, which is from oral ectoderm. Once again, because you will see this question at some point, craniopharyngioma is derived from surface or oral ectoderm. Dudes, it's even in the name. Craniopharyngioma implies that a piece of pharynx or mouth is in the brain. You can even think of the calcifications forming, because these are the same cells that form teeth. This is how they'll come after you with craniopharyngioma. They'll give you a kid with poor peripheral vision and show you a gross pathological image. They're usually even kind enough to include the buzz phrase, motor oil. Then they'll ask you about the embryological origin of this tumor, oral or surface ectoderm, or remnant of Rathke's pouch. Those all mean the same thing. All right, that's it for pediatric tumors. Three distinct tumors with unique presentations, clinical behavior, and pathologic findings as summarized. Let's move into adult brain tumors, oligodendrogliomas and glioblastoma multiforme. We'll start with the oligodendroglioma. Remember our oligodendrocytes from before? These myelinating cells of the CNS and their tomato-shaped nuclei can proliferate into oligodendrogliomas. There will be two main giveaways for this tumor fried egg cells on pathology, and new onset seizures in an adult. That is the NBME's simple math for these tumors. New seizures in adults plus fried egg cells on pathology equals oligodendroglioma. Let's pause here and review what other tumors will have this fried egg appearance under the microscope. The USMLE will want you to know that testicular seminomas and ovarian dysgerminomas will also have fried egg cells on biopsy. Let's not forget these important players covered in other videos. We move on to the scariest of the bunch, glioblastoma multiforme. GBM is a malignant high-grade tumor of astrocyte origin. Once again, astrocyte origin means that glioblastoma will stain positively for GFAP. The prognosis is terrible. The tumor grows incredibly fast, often outgrowing its blood supply, and crossing over into the other hemisphere through the corpus callosum, which gives it its nickname, the butterfly glioma. Such an adorable name for such a terrifying disease. Now that we've ruined butterflies for you, let's talk about the key pathological finding to know with GBM. Rapid growth means that the tumor will outgrow its blood supply, leading to the classic finding of pseudopalisading necrosis. When the NBME wants to ask you derivatives about glioblastoma, they'll present a middle-aged adult with a few months of dull headache worse in the morning or with new onset seizures. The exam will describe papilledema and MRI will show a contrast enhancing mass. Then they'll ask you what to expect on biopsy. The answer is pseudopalisating necrosis 
and GFAP positive cells. Or they may ask you what you should do first to treat. The answer is chemotherapy with temozolomide, and surgical resection is never the answer. This is how they play the game with glioblastoma. Bring it on. Next up is the meningioma, which grows outside the brain unlike all of our previous tumors. This is also our last tumor with an associated pathologic image. So we'll give our child pathologist the rest of the day off after this. Meningiomas grow from arachnoid cells in the meninges, which makes it extraaxial, meaning not from the brain itself. These tumors are often benign, but can cause serious problems when they push on the brain from the outside. These tumors are more common in women than men, and can present with new onset seizures or any focal neurological deficit with papilledema. As these symptoms are nonspecific, they will necessarily give additional information, namely pathology. That pathology is very characteristic and is frankly unique. World spindle cells with somoma bodies, quite different than the pathology we've presented so far. Look at how world that is. Just check out those curves. One more time, meningioma biopsy equals world spindle cells with somoma bodies. Insofar as treatment, these benign tumors usually do pretty well with surgical resection, plus or minus radiation. Two more tumors to cover, and no more pathology. The schwannoma and pineoloma will be identified with their clinical presentation and ultimately diagnosed through neuroimaging. Suspect a schwannoma in a patient with insidious defects causing facial numbness or paralysis, vertigo, and hearing loss with tinnitus all on the same side. But here come the derivatives for test day. Schwannomas are benign tumors of Schwann cells. Remember that Schwann cells myelinate the peripheral nervous system, including the cranial nerves. The most classic location for these tumors is at the cerebellopontine angle, which may involve cranial nerves 5, 7, and 8. Another fact about schwannomas that is particularly good to know is that they come from the neural crest, and that means that they will stain positively for S100. Suspect a schwannoma in a patient with insidious defects causing facial numbness or paralysis, vertigo, and hearing loss with tinnitus all on the same side. Finally, if you get bilateral acoustic schwannomas, you should immediately think about neurofibromatosis type 2 caused by an NF2 gene mutation. Our last major player that simply refuses to go away is the pineoloma. The adorable little pineal gland normally secretes melatonin, but don't sleep on the pineoloma. See what I did there? How will this tumor present? It can grow out and compress the midbrain from the dorsal side, hitting the so-called tectal area. These patients will present with a vertical gaze palsy, that is, an inability to look upwards. The USMLE loves asking about pineal gland tumors, and vertical gaze palsy is the language of the pineoloma. Let's review what we've learned so far. For the pediatric tumors, pilocytic astrocytomas will present in an irrelevant way and have pink Rosenthal fibers. Medulloblastomas are cerebellar tumors deriving from granular cells and can present with obstructive hydrocephalus and spinal metastases. Craniopharyngiomas are derived from the pharynx, that is from oral ectoderm. They will show you a calcified cyst with motor oil fluid inside. For adults, ol egg odendrogliomas have fried egg cells on pathology. Glioblastoma multiforme is a highly malignant tumor and has pseudopalisading necrosis. Meningiomas have whorled spindle cells and somoma bodies. Then there are the tumors without images to go with them. Acoustic schwannomas are most often located at the cerebellopontine angle and affect cranial nerves 5, 7, and 8. They are S100 positive because they're neural crest derived. Pineolomas compress the dorsal midbrain and impair the ability to look upwards. Metastases are just as common as primary tumors and most often come from the lung. That does it for content. Let's now try to apply some of this information and see how the NBME might come after you in these practice questions. Question 1. A 13-year-old boy with no past medical history presents with bitemporal hemianopsia. A small mass is found near his pituitary gland, which grossly appears calcified with motor oil inside. This tumor is derived from which of the following germ cell layers? Neural crest, mesoderm, endoderm, oral ectoderm, or phalloderm? 
The answer here is D. This is a craniopharyngioma in a kid with bitemporal hemianopsia and the classic motor oil fluid in a hypothalamic supracellar tumor. Remember that these tumors come from surface or oral ectoderm. Also, sorry to whoever guessed E. I just made that up and that isn't a thing. Question two. A four-year-old boy with no past medical history presents with two months of poor coordination with several recent falls and right leg weakness for the last week. MRI reveals a mass in his cerebellum. Biopsy is shown on the right. Which of the following is true about this tumor? It is benign. It is derived from Rathke's pouch. It's derived from granular cells. It cannot metastasize. Or it is derived from the neural crest. Sorry friends, neural crest is not always the answer. This is a medulloblastoma, which is derived from granular cells of the cerebellum, which themselves are derived from neural ectoderm. As for D, medulloblastomas sure as hell can metastasize, and you should be very aware of that fact. That's why the patient here presented with right leg weakness from a drop metastasis to the spinal cord. Rathke's pouch comes from oral ectoderm and describes craniopharyngiomas. Question 3. A 56-year-old woman presents with seizures. An MRI of the brain reveals a well-circumscribed mass originating from the Falk's cerebri. Which of the following is expected of this mass? High growth rate and poor prognosis, pseudopalisating necrosis and increased vascular permeability on biopsy, fried egg cells on biopsy, metastatic potential, or world spindle cells and somoma bodies on biopsy? The answer here is E. Remember how meningiomas have voluptuous whorls of spindle cells with delectable somoma bodies? Yes, the NBME seems very attracted to these. Meningiomas are benign and slow-growing, which makes A wrong. B describes glioblastoma multiforme, C describes oligodendroglioma, and medulloblastomas are the only cancers of the brain with malignant potential. And this concludes this special neurology edition of 12 Days in March. If you have any questions or concerns, please email Howard at 12daysinmarch.com. Thanks for watching.